Keith Howes, can you tell us a bit about what Gay News was? Gay News was a fortnightly newspaper for homosexuals. That's gay men and gay women in the UK. It started in June 1972 and finished, I think, in April 1983. Now, you were features editor for a while on Gay News. I was, yeah. Now, Gay News, as you mentioned, started in 1972. Before that, there was obviously the mainstream press. How did they tend to tackle homosexual stories? It seemed to me uh, in the most limited way, i.e. scandal, um, when people were discovered having homosexual relations, whether indeed with younger people or older people, it didn't matter because there was no age of consent until 1967. Um, all male homosexual relations were illegal. So it was people being caught in public toilets, being caught with their own lovers in their own homes, their names were published, and worse, their addresses. So many of them had to leave their homes, they had to sometimes leave town because of the scandal. And often, of course, they were jailed. When did you first become aware of gay news? I was aware of gay news because I lived in the Hampstead area, and gay news was sold at a few Hampstead pubs. And the people I moved around with, I'm afraid, were rather rather cynical about gay liberation. They, they thought it was unnecessary because they, of course, were so liberated they didn't need a, a political movement. So when we had the uh, chance to buy gay news, we just passed it by and giggled. A gay paper it couldn't be any good because, of course, see, gay people can't do anything, can they, really? They can't, they can't actually organise anything because they're just silly and inconsequential. I think we called it, in the end, self-hatred. We really didn't support our own newspaper. We dismissed it. But when you joined Gay News, it wasn't the first time you'd covered gay stories. You'd covered Gay Liberation for She Magazine, hadn't you? I had. I was working for She Magazine as a show business writer in the early 1970s. And about 1971, I was asked to write a piece on women's liberation. Now, unfortunately, or fortunately, the women's liberation group that we approached did not want me writing for it because I was a man. So my editor said, well, let's do gay liberation. So I went along to the London School of Economics and you had to come out. If you, if you were doing a story on gay liberation, you had to actually tell them what your sexuality was. So I stood up very boldly in the London School of Economics and said, I'm a bisexual, which wasn't true. <laughs> well, how did you get involved with gay news? I think gay news and I were always meant to meet. Uh, I read about gay liberation uh, properly when I was overseas. This was a, a march, I think in 1974. And I suddenly thought, my gosh, gay liberation has really moved on. Because I'd written the article, but it didn't really mean that much to me. It was just another article. And so when I came back to England, I bought Gay News. And I thought, yeah, this is a paper I'd really like to work for. And I saw a advert for features editor and I thought well they'll never choose me because I'm too mainstream. I was working for women's magazines but that was exactly the sort of thing they wanted. They wanted somebody from the mainstream to bring, dare I say it, an air of professionalism to what was essentially an amateur newspaper because most of the people were not trained journalists. They learnt on the job. What was the atmosphere like when you joined? Uh, a bit hippie. Uh, the letters were signed yours in uh, gay brotherhood and I just thought gosh this is terrible it was all um, a bit druggy a little bit druggy I was not into into marijuana or things like that but uh, you see I didn't really give properly because I was still playing this bisexual thing and I wasn't true to myself and it was only about six months later after I'd been with the paper and I went to a party where the staff were and they all came up to me and gave me the most beautiful hug and embrace. And suddenly I was real. You know, I was a real, the real Keith Howes, instead of still being this mainstream journalist who was slightly slumming. Because I had been told by colleagues, look, that's the end of your career. If you go and work for Gay News, that's it. You're never going to get back into mainstream journalism. Do you think it was true at the time? It probably was true at the time, because I was actually one of the few out gay journalists. There were very few out gay people in Britain at that time. You know, Graham Chapman of Monty Python, he was one of them, but see, Ian McKellen wasn't out. It took uh, another probably 15 years before he felt confident to come out of the closet. 
Uh, Elton John had come out as bisexual uh, around about 1972, 73. So it was a small group, and I was actually one of the few public homosexuals in Britain in the 70s. Graham Chapman, he was a strong supporter of the paper, wasn't he? He was. Well, he and his lover, David Sherlock, they put money into the paper when it began, and he actually did an interview, which I think was really the first out gay interview of a celebrity in a British newspaper. The first interview was with David Hockney, of course, who was an out artist. I mean, David Hockney was way in front of everybody else. He'd really come out in the, in the mid-60s. He was always out, really. He was never in. But Graham Chapman did the interview with his lover, and there are pictures of him on the sofa uh, in a very uh, amorous and loving way, again, which had never been done before. So, when you joined, how easy was it to get stories? I know you were features editor, but you would have been interviewing celebrities and people like that. How easy or how complicated was it? Well, because I had been interviewing celebrities for quite some time, I was known. You know, my name was known. And, of course, the, the way you get to meet celebrities is you go through their agents and you go through the publicists. And because I was known to the publicists and agents, amazingly, we got... Lots of big names. You know, we've got Angela Lansby, we've got Rod Stewart. We, you know, we, we didn't really have a problem. We got Shirley MacLaine, and thereby hangs a tail. Go on. Um, she was the biggest bitch I've ever interviewed, the, the, the most unsympathetic person. Um, we hated each other on sight. She was extremely uh, unsympathetic, shall we say, to the paper. I got back to the office. The editor said, we're not running the story, love. We're not doing Shirley MacLaine. Look at this. He showed me Time magazine and she'd made this horrible anti-gay remark. So the Shirley MacLaine article thankfully never appeared. But as far as interviews are concerned, we, we didn't have a problem with people who needed publicity. But there were a few people, shall we say Dirk Bogard, shall we say Vanessa Redgrave, shall we say Elton John, who did not feel that gay news was the perfect vehicle for them, for many different reasons. Uh, Cliff Richard, of course, even though we always gave Cliff's albums very positive reviews. We were very unusual because Cliff Richard was really rubbished for a long time in the 70s, but mainly because of his religious beliefs. And gay news always supported Cliff. But because I did meet Cliff... Um, Robert Morley, who was a very rotund actor, uh, was a very evil man. And as soon as he found out that uh, I was wanting to interview him, he hatched an evil plan. He was appearing on Michael Parkinson with Cliff. So he said to me, well, would you like to come along to Michael Parkinson? I said, oh, yes, yes, yes. So after he'd been interviewed and Cliff had been interviewed, he brought me before Cliff and said, this is Keith Howes, the features editor of Gay News. Cliff's face was an absolute picture of total horror. He said, oh no, not a gay lib banshee. And he and his manager fled to the lift and was never seen again. You mentioned Shirley MacLaine, yes. a bit of a nightmare. Yes. Who was your best interview? Oh, well, I love David Hockney. He, he and I got on uh, so well. He, he was adorable. But look, I didn't just interview celebrities. I interviewed lots and lots of people, not just gay people. I interviewed you know, mothers and fathers of gays, husbands and wives of gays. Uh, all kinds of people, hundreds and hundreds of people. I think the people I found the most difficult were actually the drag queens because I had a lot of prejudice against drag. I felt that it was not good for our image. You know, I was still very into the image of gays. But the more I talk to people in drag, you know, I'm so admiring, so admiring of them, particularly the older drag queens who really had to fight hard against the prejudice of the 1950s and 1960s. And I, I grew to love them. They were very royalist, you know, they, loved, they also had pictures of the Queen above the mantelpiece. And they came from a different era, and I began to understand that a lot of gay people really didn't want to be liberated. A lot of gay people were quite happy living very private, circumspect lives. And here we were, coming in and trying to get everyone to come out and be proud and all the rest of it. So I, I do think that we were perhaps a little bit um, overzealous at times. What were the greatest challenges faced by gay news? Uh, well, of course, we had major legal challenges. We had the challenge of uh, our personal ads, which were uh, deemed uh, obscene, but in fact were exonerated by court. And we always had the wonderful headline above our personal ads, Love Knoweth No Laws. And then in 1976, we published a poem. It was called The Love 
that dares to speak its name. And it was about a centurion that was harboring sexual thoughts about Christ who was dying on the cross. This poem was seen by Mrs. Mary Whitehouse and she took us to court on a charge of blasphemous libel. We were defended by John Mortimer and Geoffrey Robertson in the Old Bailey, but we lost the case. Um, Dennis Lemon, our editor, was given an 18 month suspended sentence and the paper was fined. It was both our most frightening hour and our most uh, important hour because Gay News suddenly changed from being a little backwater newspaper into being a world famous newspaper, even Time magazine mentioned the case. And from then on we got more advertising, of course more people wanted to be interviewed by us because we suddenly became respectable. Private Eye invited various members of staff to their literary lunches and Dennis Lemon was invited to join the Reform Club. So really we had a silver lining? Uh, it did and it didn't. It had a silver lining obviously in that the paper became more, more famous, we sold more copies but it had a bad effect on our editor, Dennis Lemon. What happened? He was courted by various um, rich gay men, and they basically said, look, this paper could be much better, much more professional, you know, if you did this and did that. It became more American. Suddenly, we, you know, we've had every article on disco and New York, Jim Queens, and suddenly we were losing that, well, you could say that parish pump flavour that we had. It was, it was like a little local newspaper, and that's what I liked about it. It was friendly, and I also remember there was a documentary in the 90s called It's Not Unusual. And they just talked about gay news briefly, and I loved the way they did it. They said, I love to hear the plop of that manila envelope through the door every, every fortnight, because it was in a plain manila envelope, so it meant it could go across the whole of England. We had, we had people that were illiterates, and we had Oxford Regis professors among our readers. It was the widest readership I've ever had to write for. So, in a way, in answer to your question, that was the most challenging thing. Actually, how do you write for people of all educational levels? Mm -hmm. You mentioned that during and after the Mary Whitehouse case, you kind of got a newfound respect from the mainstream press. Yes. What was it like before that? What was their attitude? Oh, the attitude was pretty dismissive, yes. Uh, certainly, as from a features editor, editor's point of view, Certainly from a features editor point of view, when I would go to press receptions, as I, as I did for many people, uh, I wouldn't be talked to, except by about two or three people, and I'll, I'll mention their names. There were two members of the press who I remember particularly being always friendly, consistently friendly. There was a guy called Steve, very fanciable, from The Melody Maker, or New Musical Express, which one of the two, and then there was Paul Gambaccini. Paul Gambaccini was a true gentleman and would always speak to me. But you see, he was American, and the Americans were much more sophisticated about gay rights than the English were at the time. The English really didn't know much about it, and they thought we were just really some kind of hippie, hippie outfit that wasn't going to last very long. And also, while you were at Gay News, you had some women staff, such as Alison Hennigan. Yes, well, it was my uh, idea to, to ask Alison to be my assistant, my assistant features editor. I'd met Alison. Actually, she lent me her bedroom at a conference so I could have sex with a mutual friend. So that's how I'd actually met Alison uh, some time ago. Uh, she was a brilliant, brilliant woman. She still is a brilliant, brilliant woman. Highly intelligent, uh, a beautiful uh, person in every way. And I just thought she would add so much to the paper. She created really this extraordinary literary supplement that we had. She also, of course, interviewed people like Arnold Schwarzenegger <laughs> and Gore Vidal and many, many, you know, very unusual celebrities. And of course, she interviewed lots of women. But Alison wasn't partisan as far as women and men were concerned. She was, she was there for the newspaper, which was for gay men and gay women. And yes, we did have women working for us, but mainly in the office, doing the classified ads, running the office, etc. Alison was the first editorial woman we had, and then uh, a, a couple of others came later, in fact, after I left. Alison, is, uh, of course, was the first lesbian to present a, a TV series. She presented the second series of Gay Life. Do you think it was easy for women working at Gay News? I think that uh, lesbians found that they were very um, sidelined, that essentially it was run by men. Uh, I was male, 
Michael Mason, news editor, was male, Dennis was male. And I would say that we weren't, you know, obviously sexist, but a lot of women felt, not just at Gay News, but in other gay organisations, that they were there basically just to make the tea. That gay men actually were just as sexist as heterosexual men, and they were probably correct. Alison brought a whole new life, vivacity, depth, intellectualism. I mean, working with Michael Mason and Alison Hennigan in the same office, I mean, Michael from Oxford, Alison from Cambridge, I had to really lift my game because these were major um, intelligences. They were also lovely people. I mean, I adored, I adored both of them. I absolutely loved working with them and um, love them to this day, of course. Now, Gay News folded and closed in 1983. You were there at the time. What was the atmosphere like? I wasn't actually working there at the time. I was, um, I was contributing articles. I think I wrote an article on Kenneth Williams and various people like that. It was very sad. It was very confused. Um, it only really just... Well, it, it did the worst thing that I can imagine for a community paper. It just went. And I'd always hoped Gay News would never be like that. I'd always hoped that if it did close, it would give the readers some time to understand why it was closing, etc. Gay News just closed. Um, was there a reason for it? Bad management, basically. Um, there is a book called The Battle for Gay News, which I recommend to anybody that wants to find out what happens to a community newspaper. I think any uh, journalism student should read The Battle for Gay News. It's excellent. Uh, that was actually written by the whole Gay News staff, um, but it was edited in a, in a fashion that you know really tried to be as objective as possible. Um, it was undercapitalized, I suppose, like many businesses. It didn't have uh, enough advertising to run it. But I think there was a, um, a confusion of ideals, shall we say, between business and um, uh, a community political newspaper that was trying to make life better for gay and lesbian people in Britain. What was its greatest legacy? Its greatest legacy. I think putting the word gay out there. I think the fact that we have no problem at all, whether we're ultra-conservative or ultra-liberal in saying the words gay marriage, without putting inverted commas around that word gay, I think is owed partly to papers like Gay News. It wasn't homosexual, it wasn't queer, it wasn't bent, it was gay. Now after Gay News folded and closed, other publications came about. Perhaps they were inspired by Gay News such as Capital Gay, which was of course founded by two previous writers from Gay News. You contributed to Capital Gay. Now how did newspapers like Capital Gay differ from Gay News? Well, Capital Gay started in 1980. Michael Mason left uh, Gay News just before I did, and he and Graham McCarrow decided they would start a newspaper that wouldn't rely on advertising. The problem was that a paper like Gay News absolutely relied on advertising, not just on advertising from uh, its um, classified ads, but also from record companies, from theatre, gay bars, gay clubs. That's a lot to, to, you know, to, to make sure that each fortnight you've got enough advertising basically to pay uh, the staff costs and the, the costs of running a newspaper were, were quite high. So Graham and Michael decided that they would run a very plain newspaper. No frills, black and white, no colour heading, no ads, and it would just be the news of gay men, I think I'm right in saying this, I think it was gay men in London. That was why it was called Capital Gay. They're very stripped down. Michael uh, has very good business sense, and the paper ran, I think, until something like, would it be 1988 or 89, something like that. It, 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 it ran, uh, maybe even later, it may have ran into the, into the 1990s. Of course, there were other magazines that were concurrent with Gay News. There was Him magazine, and um, we looked down on Him. It was poor. It was poor. We had, a, a, we had lots of people coming into the Gay News office, all sorts of people, one of whom was Alan Gloke. And Alan Gloke was one of the publishers of Him magazine. And we regarded him as the pornographer. 
Many years later, I re-met Alan. He was the mayor of his local town and a more delightful and beautiful person you could not meet. So again, Mr. Howes had to climb down from his ivory tower and actually accept that gay people and gay publications are of all kinds, not just the um, pure political um, perfection of gay news. So there were other, uh, there are other things, of course, Gay Times came out of Gay News. They actually bought the, uh, the name of uh, Gay News. Gay Times is still running. Of course, we've got Attitude now. And these are so far away from Gay News, you can't believe it, because they've got new printing techniques, which means there's lots of colour pictures. They're glossy, they're sexy, lots of sexy men. Um, totally different from Gay News. Gay News would be laughed out of... Uh, out of the arena now. It, it just looks sweetly cosy. You yourself, you wrote an article, it was an interview I think based on the partner of an AIDS patient. Now who was that for? That was for Capital Gay. That was very interesting because uh, I had a friend, my oldest friend, my school friend Howard, and he was diagnosed with AIDS. He was the 33rd person in Britain to be diagnosed with AIDS. And he put me in touch with this chap called Richard, whose partner had recently died, who was a Canadian, and he'd been basically sent back to Canada in a body bag. It was just horrible. And I did this two-part interview with Richard, and I suppose that was the first time that it really came home to me, just how dire things were. It was like watching a tsunami coming towards us. We just felt so helpless. What on earth were we going to do? It just seemed that every other person was coming down with this this thing, this collection of disastrous and ugly and separating things called, in a, in a general term, AIDS. What was the reaction to your article? Uh, I don't think it was any major reaction to it. I, I, I've never really had much reaction to anything that I've written, except when I said that Peggy Lee wore a wig, and Peggy Lee's fans <laughs> were very upset. No, I, I generally don't stimulate. The, the, the article in Gay News that caused the most ruction was Jack Babuccio, who was a wonderful writer, very handsome man, did all our film writing for us. He wrote an article called Don't Rock the Boat, and it was about not rocking the boat. In other words, living a lie, passing a straight, not upsetting anyone, not upsetting the establishment. And that really drew the ire of a lot of conservative readers, because see, we had a lot of conservative readers because they didn't have any other gay newspaper. It wasn't that they could have the Daily Telegraph of gays. They had to have the Sunday Mirror of gays, the Times of, of gays. We were, we were trying to be all those newspapers, plus something very different. 